today. I um, want to share with you something of what I believe God would want to say to us this morning. I originally um, heard this at the end of the summer. I'd had a, a strange summer where I'd felt somewhat disconnected from God for some reason. And as I reflected on that and looked back, I realized that he had been speaking to me and the one message that had been repeated was along the lines of this. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will never fail you, nor abandon you. Amen. We'll read that again. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will never fail you, nor abandon you. That's Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. But then if you actually look up the word or the expression do not fear or do not be afraid, there are so many references in the Bible where one person or other is being told not to be afraid. It's a common occurrence and I'm sure we're thinking of those that we can remember now. I guess the obvious ones are the ones that we're going to be looking at in a couple of months time when Gabriel says it to Mary, right? Or the angel say it to the shepherds, do not be afraid. And you kind of understand that because if I saw an angel or a host of angels in the sky, I think I would be slightly uncomfortable initially because it's not an everyday occurrence, right? So that's an understandable instruction. Do not be afraid. So this was the message that I felt God was saying to me over the summer. But I felt it wasn't just for me in that sense of being disconnected from God. I sensed it was something for more than just me, for, for leadership. And I shared it at the leadership type team day away. But then it's still with me. And when I was asked to preach, I thought, hmm, I wonder if that message is for now, for today. And as I was wondering this and thinking about it, I'd used it in a certain uh, context earlier and somebody relayed back to me that it had really spoken to them and they felt very strongly that I needed to know that that particular message was right on for them at that time. So I took that as God saying to me, yes, it is. It is a message for today. It's still got legs, as they say. It's still relevant. It's still what God wants to, uh, people to hear. So here I am today. But I have to tell you, this week, building up to coming here today, God has not let up. Even to the point of, I was in uh, LST, the uh, London School of Theology, just popped in this week, haven't been there for ages, went into the ladies, and it was on the back of the cubicle door. Can you believe it? Do not be afraid. The Lord your God is with you. Oh. And then I looked at one of my, uh, I don't know if you've got version Bible app, on your phone, you can pick up um, Bible reading notes uh, of varying lengths and all topics under the sun. And I tend to pick them and think, oh, that's interesting, and then forget all about it, and then go back and it says, you're 18 days behind time. And then you feel condemned. No, you don't. Feel no, it says, do you want to catch up? Yes, please. So you catch up and you start again and then you forget. Anyway, so that's me. 
but I'd picked this one and I hadn't looked at it for ages. I've got a number sitting there waiting to be looked at. And I thought, oh, I'll look at this one today. What was the verse? Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. I couldn't believe it. What are the odds of that? Am I allowed to say that? Yeah. What, 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 you know, so for me, what I'm trying to say to you is, as much as you can be sure of something, I am sure God wants me to say this to us today. So do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. So whatever you're looking into at this moment, whatever your week is looking like at this moment, the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will never fail you. Hear that. He will never fail you, nor abandon you. And also, talking with Hannah this week, we both had the same image. We both had the same image as we discussed what God was wanting to do. More of that later. The other verse, so that comes at the end of um, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. And then straight after that, you've got Joshua. The context being that he is now the leader. Moses is not going to lead them into the promised land. He is. So at the beginning of Joshua, chapter 1, it says, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you, from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north. From the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I will give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either from the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There's that promise again. The same promise of God being with us. Do not be afraid. He is with you. So do not be afraid. Easier said than done, right? Fear is a powerful emotion. We need it. It's a, it's a primitive human emotion and it alerts us to the perceived presence of danger or threat. We need it. We need it to survive. We need to be able to recognize when things are a threat to us and to have that flight or fight response. And apparently, according to the experts, you can divide fear into two stages. This is where you might want to get your notebooks out. There's the biochemical stage and the emotional stage. The biochemical stage, the biochemical reaction to fear 
is universal. So, for example, if a lion came in here now, we would all have the same biochemical reaction. Whilst the emotional reaction, the emotional response to fear is highly individualized. We'd all react differently emotionally to things that others wouldn't find fearful. So what kind of things do we fear? Yeah, we'd all be fearful of a lion. That's, that's a given. But sometimes we can be frightened of people or maybe an individual. For whatever reason, whatever history there is, somebody can evoke a fearful response in us. We can be fearful of the future, what it does or doesn't hold. We can be fearful of what's happened in the past happening again in the future, the past repeating itself. I'm not doing that because I know what happened last time. I'm not going through that again. Fear of repeating the same experience again. Fear of confronting past hurts. We bury things, don't we? We need to, to survive. We can't manage day-to-day -day living. And these things that get shoved down and down and down, they don't disappear. They, they seem to disappear, but they're still there. And then what happens is we have a baffling response to something quite innocuous. And we think, why did I feel like that? Why do I feel so sad? Why do I feel so frightened now? Why do I feel so angry? And a lot of the time it's because there's stuff there that we're too frightened to look at that we've shoved down and suppressed. And we've managed, but only up to a point. Fear of failure. Whoa, yeah. I'm a working example of this. Fear of success. Fear of being judged. Fear of losing face, of losing friends. Fear of emotional pain, fear of embarrassment. Fear of being abandoned or fear of being alone. This is not, uh, this is a list that will go on forever, but fear of rejection, fear of expressing your true feelings, fear of intimacy, fear of the unknown, fear of loss. Fear of death. As I say, the list is unending, and I'm sure we could name other things that evoke fear in us. So I've mentioned what can happen when we suppress things and don't look at them for very valid reasons because we need to get on with life. The consequence of living with fear is, well, one, hindrance. You're impeded at some level. You'll go so far and that's enough because of a fear. We tend to think of do not fear. We think of it in terms of God and church and you walk with the Lord, and that's included, but I would want to suggest this also broader. Every element, every aspect of our life, God would want us to remember, do not be afraid. 
do not be afraid. But if we are living with fear, we can be shackled, impeded, chained, if you will, in some area of our life because of some aspect of fear. And God would address that this morning. God would want us to acknowledge it and to allow him to deal with it. We can't deal with it in our own strength. But he can and, I am convinced, wants to. So, in my um, musings, I thought, okay, do not be afraid. Do not fear, for the Lord is with you. What? Just think for a moment, because this is quite an interesting one. What's the opposite of fear? Any suggestions? Faith? Success? Courage? Trust? Well, I googled this to get the definitive answer. Um, and there isn't one. Different people suggest different things. It's interesting, isn't it? Interesting. And the, the things that have been said were mentioned. And I came across an article written by a Christian. The opposite of fear. I've always thought that the opposite of fear was courage. Growing up, every time I would express fear, my dad would tell me to be brave. When my kids tell me they're scared, I remind them that courage isn't not being fearful. Courage is overcoming fear. I think if you think about it, you wouldn't be courageous if it wasn't for the fear. So many sermons I've done over the years had to do with Overcoming fear with courageous faith. Obviously, courage is very much linked to fear, but courage isn't the opposite of fear. According to the thesaurus, so he says, uh, the opposite of fear is safety. The opposing feeling to being scared is feeling secure. He says, maybe I'm the last one at this party, to this party, but that is very interesting to me. And as I began to think about this, I started thinking about my life, my marriage, my ministry, my relationships. And I have spent much more time trying to be a courageous Christian than I have a secure Christian. I'll say that again. I've spent much more time trying to be a courageous Christian than a secure Christian. I've spent much more time trying to prove how brave I am, how much faith I have, than I have spent resting in the safety of my relationship with God. I'm not talking, this is him saying, I'm not talking about safety in the sense of not taking risks, that's a different kind of safe. I'm talking about feeling so secure in your relationship with God that you don't fear others noticing your imperfections. I'm going to say that again. Feeling so secure in your relationship with God that you don't fear others noticing your imperfections. 
And he goes on to suggest that we've made the church the least safe place on earth. We want to be safe to be real, safe to feel stressed out, safe to be imperfect, safe to admit marriage problems, safe to not have all the answers, safe to make parenting mistakes, safe not to have it all together, safe to admit failure, struggle, sin, addiction, Safe to acknowledge that our thoughts, good, bad, and indifferent, are what they are, thoughts, and they don't define us. See, one of the fears I didn't mention earlier, and I hadn't even thought about it until Kevin mentioned it in beta, is a fear of God. A fear of God. Now, yes, we are, Scripture does talk about the fear of the Lord, but I'm talking about crippling, paralyzing, irrational, immobilizing fear of God. Fear that you're not good enough. Fear that He frowns on you. Fear that He's fed up with you making the same mistakes, asking the same questions, not learning the lessons. Fear that you fall short of the mark. Fear that He doesn't really want to invest in you. Fear that you don't really count. That impedes, that robs us of that security in that relationship with him. Because we're always striving to be better, striving to be good enough, striving to win his approval, his love. Oh, you know what? I read my Bible every day this week. I'm in his good books today. It doesn't work like that. But we still think like that. We still think like that. Oh, I forgot to pray for the guys out in Bosnia. I'm rubbish. God won't like me anymore. I said I would and I didn't. It doesn't work like that. We focus on all the wrong things sometimes. And we measure ourselves with ridiculous standards. Ridiculous standards. That has nothing at all to do with how God sees us at all. That's why we need to read our Bibles and understand what God is saying to us. Because we corrupt things in our minds and set standards that don't exist. And then condemn ourselves. And then feel rubbish. And miss out on so much miss out on so much. We spend so much energy telling ourselves how rubbish we are. I think it was Joyce Meyer said, we spend so much time talking to ourselves, we might as well say, start telling ourselves that we're doing okay. Because we are. We are. What was it you said last week? I was in Sunday Club, but someone quoted it to me. We are God's best work. We are God's best work. We are the pinnacle of his work. Do we believe that? Do we live it? Do we relate to him in that context? Or do we relate in the fact that we've failed, we've let him down, we've thought this, we've thought... I tell you what, you want to travel on the underground and be gracious and not let God down. Forget it. Yeah, so I digress. We all have our struggles, but they shouldn't be the focus of how we measure ourselves, measure our relationship with God, or how God sees us. And if we're in a place where we're fearing God, we're not getting the best out of the relationship. And he wants that to change
So what did Kevin say, I hear you ask? Well, Kevin was talking about how important it is when you read scripture to note the different nuances, like the case, the, the tense of a sentence, whether it's past or present, because sometimes there's a significance in it. What is she talking about? I'll try and explain. You know the story of the calming of the storm? When the disciples were in the boat and they were petrified, terrified, and Jesus was asleep, apparently oblivious to the impending doom. And he calms the storm. And instead of saying to them, why were you afraid? I think he says, why were you afraid in Matthew? And, or why are you afraid, he says. And where is your faith in Mark? As in present tense. So the storm's finished. Everything's calm. And Kevin said, they weren't frightened of the storm. They were frightened of him. Who is this man? Why are you frightened, he says to them, as in now, right now, in the boat with me? Why are you frightened of me? And yes, of course we fall short. We all do. That's the point. That's why he had to come and do what he did. We're never going to overcome that and win it in our own merit. If that's what you're doing, you're wasting your time. Luke. Luke 5. Luke 5, verse 8. The story here so far is the disciples, although they weren't the disciples at that point, they were just fishermen, had been out fishing all night, came back with empty nets, And Jesus suggests, go out into the deeper water and let your net down and catch some fish. And he says, well, we can, but we've been out there all night and not caught anything. But they do do it anyway. And of course, there's a massive catch of, of fish. In verse 8, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I am too much of a sinner to be around you. And we can relate to that, can't we? I think the closer you get to God, the more acutely aware you become of how rubbish we are and our failings. For he was awestruck by the number of fish. Look at Jesus' reply, and he would say that to you today don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't measure yourself by your standards. But it's an understandable reaction to the majesty of God. And then in Revelation, Revelation 1, this is John. He describes a vision of Jesus. Standing, this is from verse 20, oh sorry, 13. Standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. 
But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So the good thing is we don't have to explain ourselves to him because he knows. He knows. He knows our struggles. He knows our misunderstandings about him and who he is. He hears our pleas and our arguments and our whys and why not. And he understands. And he says, do not be afraid. Trust in God and obeying what scripture tells us to do is the way forward. Again, not easy. I read um, a quote this week. I don't think it was a Christian who said, where there is trust, there is no fear. Where there is trust, there is no fear. Do you remember the old chorus, trust and obey, for there's no other way? And I think that's true. Trust and obey. Have you tried to overcome your fear by just being brave and not pursuing security in Christ? Have you tried to overcome your fear by just being brave and not pursuing security in Christ? So I um, mentioned earlier when Hannah and I were talking about today her thoughts of it, what I was thinking. It turned out that we both had had the same picture. We both had the same picture of chains being broken. And I would like to suggest that that that's what God is wanting to do today. It may well be that as I've been speaking, something has... Is that going to stay? No. As I've been speaking today, something has resonated within you. That you're aware of fear impeding you in some area of your life. It might well be fear of, of God, but that list I read, there were so many things. And if you know that God is speaking to you today, then in this next time of response, please, please take the opportunity to respond to him. Close our eyes for a moment. Lord, you are a good God. We recognize our failings and frailties. Help us also recognize how much you love us how much we are valued in your sight. 
because of what Jesus did on that cross. I want to pray, Lord, for those of us who know they have fear, who recognize the chains where it impedes, where it cripples, where it stops. We pray for those chains to be broken today, for freedom to be the experience, freedom and security in our relationship and walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.